Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habita fil assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh hayyakum Allah and welcome to our dawra or our series of lectures with the study of the text marital discord or an-nashuz by Sheikh Dr. Saleh ibn Ghanim al-Sadlan and this text, the Habatifillah, is something which can be beneficial for those that are married and those that wish to get married. It's an essential text to study and to learn and benefit from on how to deal with marital issues, marital discord. And with that being the case, the Habatifillah, we ask that Allah Azza wa Jal puts barakah and we're going to do our best. We're going to finish this treatise in a series. And during the course of this lesson, we will talk about, we'll introduce the treatise and introduce the topic and talk about it from a linguistic point of view, the concept or the terminology, uh, nashuz. And with that being the case, this is a short course that is sponsored by Al Athari Institute, which can only materialize with your support. So we thank you. Jazakum Allah Khairan. Wa Fakana wa Iyakum ila Kuluma Yuhibuhu La wa Yarada. And without prolonging the introduction, we'll get right into the treaties. So the Sheikh begins in talking about this important topic, and again, it's a topic that Married, uh, married couples need to uh, be, aware with, be aware of and how to deal with marital issues as well as those that wish to get married. So, meaning all of us in some way or another, we need to be aware of these issues on how to deal with discord that arises in a marriage. Because all marriages have various challenges and struggles. Some of them they have serious challenges and struggles and the people are unable to cope and deal with it or perhaps as marriage itself and divorce itself goes on the ahkam of khamsa meaning the five uh, fiqh rulings that sometimes it is wajib, it's an obligation to get married sometimes it is recommended to get married sometimes it is mubah or permissible to get married. And sometimes it is disliked to get married under certain circumstances and perhaps even haram under certain circumstances. And likewise, a habatifillah is the case scenario of divorce that sometimes it fits under those ahkam where it is uh, recommended or perhaps even an obligation. Maybe a spouse renounces Islam. For example, a woman, she's married, she's a righteous woman, and her husband leaves Islam. He leaves the deen. Under those circumstances, it would be necessary for her to leave, uh, be separated from her husband. And the other ahkam, as we mentioned. So how do we deal with those scenarios? And moreover, how do we deal with marital discord or disunity or uh, a lack of harmony in the home. Ahabatifillah, the Shaykh begins this phenomenal, fantastic treatise by saying, Islam has protected the marriage contract with a fence of safeguards and has made it abundant and, imp uh, and important such that it is distinguished from all other contracts. Islam has elevated above the other ties of obligations and all other uh, contracts that people enter into within their lives. The Noble Quran has described it in a way that no other contract has been described. It is called a firm and strong covenant. Allah the Most High says, and how could you take it back while you have gone into each other 
and they have taken from you a firm and strong covenant. And this is in Surah Al-Nisa, verse 21. Needless to say, any covenant that Islam looks at in such a way cannot be done away with by the simplest means, meaning marriage and divorce are serious matters, as it is illustrated in the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And divorce should not be something that is taken lightly or com coming easily. After this contract, the man and woman become a spousal couple after each of them had been individuals. So meaning that they're united now. Now you are joined in the marital bond, which is sanctioned uh, in, the Islam, uh, in Islam as an Islamic institution, according to Islamic mores and rituals, according to the book in the Sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Yes, in their numbers, they are individuals, but in the true balance, they are now a couple. This is because each one resembles the other. They each carry each other's dreams and hopes and pains. Allah has described the great extent of the relationship when he said, Hunna libasu lukum wa antum libasu luhunna. Allah Taala says, Fikitabi la aziz. They are a libas, like a protection or a garment for you and you are the same for them. So here Allah Taala lets us know that our spouses are like garments for us. They cover one another, cover, cover us. They cover our faults. They cover our mistakes. They keep our household secrets within the home. And they protect and support one another. And even if, because it is not a condition that your, your wife or your husband, that you have all the same likes. For example, some men, there maybe they love sports and activity. It's not a condition that the wife he marries loves sports and uh, activity unless he makes that a condition. That is his personal preference. Then that's no problem. But after the marriage contract, that is not necessarily something that they uh, need to have in common necessarily. However, they do need to support and strengthen one another in their dreams and goals and aspirations. Otherwise, that can be a source of uh, causing disunity within the marriage, meaning that the marriage can have troubles because of that, because of that and sometimes can even divorce and separate. This Quranic expression describes how the two have come together, cover one another, protect one another, and beautify one another. Islam is taking care to accentuate the psychological and spiritual relationship between the spouses and has stressed the strong relationship between them and the strong covenant ruling them. Because this is an Islamic institution, a lot of us, we forget that and we get married because we want to have the halal. This is a very common thing that we experience, especially for those of us who come to Islam. A lot of times we have a different concept of Islam because we've had a previous lifestyle and a preview, previous way of living and previous mores and values. So often we may or may not take the marriage covenant as serious as it should be or in the same light as it is in the book in the sunnah. And this is, uh, can, can make marriage easy and divorce easy. And definitely divorce should not be something that we take lightly. If there are serious problems and issues that can't be resolved for, resolved, for example, the husband is abusive, then yes, divorce should be easy in that thing if the husband is excessively abusive physically, mentally, and spiritually. Or he doesn't pray anymore. He doesn't worship Allah Tabarakatala. He becomes a Hindu. Whatever the case may be, that <clears throat> these are. This is a type of spiritual abuse, and this is um, this is something that will invalidate the contract. So under those circumstances, of course, it can become. Uh, it's not taken lightly, but it can happen easily. So between them, there is a confirmed close tie and strong connection that induces them to mercy and bonding between each other. And it protects them by the will of Allah from transgression and enmity. Because marriage, <clears throat> it should be like a shield to protect you from the haram. And to keep you from transgressing between yourselves. And that's why it's a, a you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes muadda wa rahma between 
the husband and wife, if they have the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah gives them love and that uh, between them and mercy between them, that they're merciful with one another, always not beating each other up, not violating each other with speech and actions, you know, not listening to the husband, speaking harsh and crazy to the husband. Likewise, the husband should be listening and attentive to his wife or wives. If he has two, three or four wives, he needs to be uh, uh, respectful. And that is a whole nother scenario because that means he's managing various households. He is managing various uh personalities and he's interacting with various personalities and various whims and various ways of thinking and perhaps cultural norms and so that is even a greater struggle for the husband to manage the institution of marriage based on the book and the sunnah based on love and mercy between those wives and understanding their jealousies and understanding how to judge that and understanding how to adjudicate you know, and, and manage the affairs sometimes that may arise between wives or at least the jealousy between wives, how to keep uh, as equal as, par as possible, how to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible in that relationship. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that the marriage and even in those polygamous situations that those, uh, the, the, relationship the husband has between every individual wife should be uh, that they are like one. Allah Ta'ala says in Kitab Al-Aziz, Ya ayyuhan nasa taqur rabbukum alladhi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalin kathirun wa nisa'a. Allah Ta'ala says in Kitab Al-Aziz, O mankind be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single person and from him he created his wife. And from them both, he created many men and women. This is Surah Al-Nisa, verse 1. So respecting that common source encompasses the relationship between the spouses, making them like two complementary souls in a relation of love and mercy, and it also directs them to piety and righteousness. So the marriage in Islam, it should direct the people to piety and righteousness. It shouldn't encourage the wife to do more disobedience. It shouldn't encourage the husband to be more disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, they should be encouraging one another to do ibadah, encouraging one another to come closer to Allah, encouraging one another to do khair, not encouraging and discouraging one another from good, and not to encourage one another to sin. And sometimes even by their actions and their behavior and their speech and the way they interact with their spouse, or spouses, they can encourage them to disobedience. And that is not the maqsid shari. That is not according to the sharia-based intent. Rather, they should comfort one another, strengthen one another in the obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, strengthen one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitabi al-kareem, wa taqullah alladhi tasa'anuna bihi wal arham. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And fear Allah through whom you demand your mutual rights. We both have rights. The husband and wife. Or the husband and the wives. They have rights. And do not cut off the relations of the wombs, the ties of kinship. So each of them has in its partner happiness, support, and intimacy. If he or she fears his or her Lord with respect to the spouse and builds a relationship between them upon sincerity and faithfulness. So very important that the husband and wives, they have rights over one another physical, mental, and spiritual. Their lives together in the framework of the family has its goal and purpose in bringing about of the best environment, such as that each one of the partners can fulfill their needs and goals. Marriage is not a partnership in which each partner tries to maximize his profits alone without worrying if the other partner is losing or not. That's imperative, Ahabit Tevilah, to understand that, that it's not a, uh, you know, as they say, Russian roulette, or it's not a way of where you're just trying to capitalize off a spouse. And this is what happens, especially in those short-term marriages when people just marry, okay, because okay, they want the gratification. La bas. Okay. But Islamic marriage is more than that. That you've also got to see beyond that. You've got to strive to give one another their rights, to comfort one another, to try to empathize with one another and understand one another and help one another to reach uh, his or her 
uh, goals. And it should not be about, I'm just getting mine. YOLO, live only once or whatever. It's not about YOLO, it's not about BOLO or anything in between that. But rather, it is about a mutual respect, a mutual relationship. And just think how many divorces could have possibly been averted if the people learned to give one another their rights and respected one another and tried to listen to one another and make positive changes if need be in their relationships. Marriage is not a partnership to which each per partner tries to maximize the profits. Indeed, it is a contract attended to by the two spouses that each of them will work and act on the behalf of the other. They will mutually assist one another, sacrifice for each other, such that they can gain mutual happiness. This is the relationship of tranquility that is found in Allah's statement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْعَزِيزِ هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ نَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا وَجَعْلَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا لِيَسْكُنَ إِلَيْهَا He it is who created you from a single person. And then he is created from his wife in order that he may enjoy the pleasure of living with her. The marriage Marriage in Islam, as we know, a should not be a source of torture. Going to one's home should not be entering the torture chamber. For example, if a husband works, which is the asl, or, you know, ha brings in the money that he comes home, he should find the comfort and the refuge that he needs in his home. Likewise, the wife that may be at home, she should not find harm and turmoil that oh no he's home again everything is destroyed now there's nothing there's not going to be anything good or likewise sometimes it's the woman that works or sometimes the women and the men work so ala kulli hal the home should be a place of refuge many of us have struggles in our jobs in our workplace with workplace um uh, uh, workplace uh, with individuals in the workplace and the workforce and just going out in the stress of traffic and the stress in the dunya they need to come home and it should be a place of refuge the home an Islamic home should be a place of refu refuge and peace and stability and harmony bi'idnillah ta'ala so therefore the noble Quran brings to the forefront the spiritual goal of marriage and that is that the soul can find comfort and sol solace from natural sexual desires, because it's natural, by love between the spouses. So, it is very important that they strive to comfort one another. The physical part of marriage is so important. Now, there are sometimes, because of age, women may become elderly or men and may not have the same desires that they had when they were younger. And sometimes that even breaks down. That is going to be something that the individual household has to determine because sometimes there are, you could say, almost marital agreements that maybe the wife, she just wants the stability of a home and she doesn't necessarily, now that's rare, desire that physically. And the husband has another one or two wives and I know situations like this. And that they had a covenant to where this wife understood and she just wanted the stability of her home with her children and the other wives, you know, she gave up that right of having those relations and he enjoyed his other wives. This is going to depend upon the individual, but the asal is everyone has that right to that physical companionship and that comfort. Furthermore, the circle of love, mercy, and union is now extended through marriage to the in-laws. Emotional maturity and human compassion is completed and spread from between the parents to the children. This is the meaning that is implied in the Quranic verse, Women ayati and khalaqa lakum men fin anfusihim azwajin li taskunu ilayha wa ja'ala baynakum muwaddatan wa rahma. Muwadda wa rahma. And among his signs is this. Those are the ayat koniya. Those are the signs in the creation. And among his signs, which show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. So from the signs that show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, and those are rulings, and those are also regulations, and that for, which, for us to follow, 
And among his signs is this, that he created for you wives from amongst yourselves, that you may find repose in them. And he has put between you affection and mercy. Jiddin muhim. So you also have to realize that's a fadl min Allah. That Allah puts that mawadda, that love, and that mercy. Because not everyone is able to achieve that. Some people they marry and they don't have necessarily the, the love and the affection. And that can come from a lot of reasons. And that's really outside the scope of, of our, uh, our, our, our study here. But it's important to know that every household is going to be different. And that the asal is, is that we want to have that mercy and that affection. You need at least mercy and empathy in your home. Even if the affection is lacking, you need the mercy. And some people need the affection. Some women are very affectionate and they need that from a husband. And some men are overly affectionate. They need that from a woman. They need that comfort. That's what keeps them halal. That's what keeps them focused. That's what keeps them out of trouble. They need that grounding. That which helps them to, to practice the book and the sunnah. Is that affection? So affection, la shak, is very important. The shaykh goes on to say, he says, all of the relations between the spouses fall under this Quranic guidance and emanate from it. If the family made up of the husband and wife is the first social set of society, that is the foundation for the creation of society, then it is a must that the affairs of that set, by, uh, set be made good and proper by setting forth a head or leader for that family that is obeyed and who guides the fa affairs of the family in the way that is proper and correct. SubhanAllah. The Sheikh really, you know, has great insight or had great insight. I believe the Sheikh passed. Allah yarhamu. I'm not sure. But this treatise is, is a very poignant, po uh, very, very powerful and precise treaties in dealing with this topic of marital discord and just the maqsad, the intent of, of, of zawaj, of, of marriage in Islam. And so he said that Islam, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is legislated for us to have a head. And that's why we have a leader in the community. We have an emir. We have a, you know, a leader of a Muslim country or a khalifa or what have you. You have that authority. You need authority. Islam respects authority. And that goes for the household. Because if the household is unruly and rebellious and lacking righteousness and lacking a direction, it is folda, it's chaos. And that is a reflection in the greater society, as the Sheikh is mentioning. That by having a strong household, you are a strong contributor. You are a part of contributing to the society. If you have chaos in your home, you cannot really contribute strongly to the rest of society because your children make up that society if you have children you both you and your spouse make up that society you make up the community you make up the greater community and if we have a house if we have a community even a neighborhood or neighborhoods full of just marital discord spousal abuse to the left in this apartment uh cursing and attacking in this apartment cursing in front of the kids in this car apartment, no prayer and just no spiritual development. What, how does that make up the whole community? If you have 20 households out of 100, that's one-fifth. That's a lot of uh, damage to your community. And some communities have way more. Tons of um, spousal abuse and, and um, physical abuse. And some communities, you know, just have all kind of, uh, of discord and disharmony and this is, reflects in the greater society. May Allah forgive us all and bless us to be, have barakah in our families and stronger Muslim uh, communities. So the woman is naturally, so the Sheikh was go, leading, alluding to the fact that the husband is, the, is that boss. He's running things. This is so important. So we're going to stop here for a quick second. Because what we have now, we have a mass infiltration of feminism in many Muslim societies. I didn't say here in the West, I said many Muslim societies. Bell, all Muslim societies are, are infected to a greater or lesser extent with contemporary ideologies. And one of those ideologies, or a couple of them that kind of go hand in hand is feminism and progressivism. So there are many Muslim women who want to rule the household. 
or they feel so much about, so strongly about m women's rights that they subvert the sh Sharia. They don't, they don't want to hear anything about a woman being um, obedient to her husband, respecting her husband, anything. No, he, I respect him if he respects me. I'll have relations with him if he gives me money and does that. So what kind of relationship does that become? These are real scenarios. We've lost track and we've been infected and affected as societies, as Muslim communities. So you have a lot of sisters, especially, it really doesn't matter whether you say younger or old. Or they, many of us are uh, infected by that and by the feminism. So they don't want a head of a household. They want to be on equal footing. Okay, this is very problematic. This is very problematic. And some women have the audacity, in a sense, to want the husband to give the rights. No, you're paying all the bills. I don't even want to pay a phone bill. You pay for everything. That's, your, that's what your duty is. But she doesn't want to obey him. She doesn't want to uh, come to the bed when he uh, want, wants for her to do that. She doesn't want, she wants more from him, not just rights. She wants to accumulate wealth and buy things and, and be uh, materialistic. And she doesn't want to cook. She doesn't want to clean. She doesn't even want to beautify herself. She doesn't want to do anything. This is, this is a real sad reality. And how many divorces happen, with that, happen because of that, especially with newer generations of Muslims? The younger generations, this is a, a plague and it's happening in droves in, around the world, in Muslim uh, countries as well as in Muslim minority communities. And a lot of it, it comes from the in, being infected in the mind, thinking that she doesn't, she doesn't want to listen to the husband. And a very important right is the husband has obedience from his wife. That is pure Islam. That's pure kitab wa sunnah. Even if he has shortcomings, that's still his right. His right, his right doesn't go. Oh, he didn't buy you this. Oh, he spoke mean to you that day. Well, that's wrong. He should seek forgiveness from Allah and apologize. But that still doesn't give you the right to be disobedient. It still doesn't give you a right to snap and attack back and be like this, not cook, not clean, not beautify, not do anything, uh, destroy the household. It's imperative to know and understand this. So we have a mass in wave of infections around in, in the Muslim community where this has become the norm. Sisters have weaponized their sexuality, sexuality, uh, akramakum Allah, and weaponize their position and not thinking about that total obedience because the only way the woman is not to be obedient to the husband, meaning in that which is disobedience to Allah, in that which is disobedience to Allah, that's, that's his right. So even if he says something, it's normally mubah. You know, I like you to do apples like this and put the cherry on top with the, the cream on the top in the middle. You know, I prefer that. Okay, that's a preference. But he commands you to do that. Doesn't mean you have to fight him. No, because he commanded you even doing the mubah. It was normally something which is, is uh, permissible to eat. Now it becomes wajib for you because it's obedience to your husband. It's his right. He, he asked you to do that. That's obedience to him and he did not ask you to do anything haram. So it's so important to put that in perspective. Likewise, the husband. We'll get to that shortly. So it's very important. The Shaykh goes on to say, he says, the woman is naturally conditioned and created by Allah to perform the functions of pregnancy, uh, of naturally conditioned and created by Allah to perform the functions of pregnancy, giving birth, taking care of the internal affairs of the house. Man, on the other hand, has been endowed with more physical strength and clear thought, and he is, therefore, more befitting to be the leader of the household. And the one responsibility for providing the means of livelihood. So that's the asl. That's, it, that's her right is to be taken care of, that you provide uh, um, roof, food, clothing. 
and the one responsible for providing the means of livelihood, protecting the family, bringing about security and continuance in the family. The man then has the following rights over his wife. He has the right to be obeyed, except for concerning something that a law has prohibited. He has the right to be treated in a respectable, decent, and proper manner by his wife. The wife should sacrifice and give for him and protect him from annoyance and disturbances. She should please him in the manner that a wife can do. She should keep distress and anger away from him. Don't anger your husband. Don't make him more stressed. Comfort him. She should prevent those things that result in anger and dislike. She should not let the house become a living hell, wherein the husband only finds hardship and distress and does not find any happiness whatsoever. This is absolutely imperative, Ahabit Tefillah, to not let breakdown in your households reach the level to where it's just pure misery. Misery for the husband, misery for the wife. So that means the husband and wife have to pay attention to the needs of one another, pay attention to their needs, and understand when even perhaps their needs might need to be submitted, uh, subverted for the needs and the wishes of the spouse. That as one of our mashayikh, we sat with uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad uh, Abdul Wahab uh, Al-Aqil, one of our mashayikh in Medina. And may Allah preserve him. And he gave us beautiful advice about, you know, how to deal with uh, marital discord when the wife is angry. And he told us about one of our scholars, and we know who it was. We won't mention him, but several of the, some of the elder Mashaikh there in Medina have more than one wife. They have two wives, many of them. Sheikh Salih Suhaimi, Imam Abdul Masin al-Abad, Kathir, Kathir. Some of them, anyway. Sheikh Ibrahim Raheli, who's younger, and many other Mashaikh, they have more than one wife. Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab al aqil the one we were at his home, he has two wives. So, Anyhow, the sheikh said that this sheikh, who's one of our elder mashayikh, that when his wives become angry, he deals with this beautiful, beautifully. He will just go and kiss the forehead of her. She's angry, she's upset, and this takes all the wind out of her. Okay? Now, we said, sheikh, that works in your culture. <laughs> we have a different, we have different cultures and different things. That kiss on the forehead might be responded with by something else. Well, law Mr. Anne. But that was a beautiful piece of wisdom. He also said that marriage is based on tafahim. That like compromise in, in this, this compromise in understanding that, yes, marriage in Islam is in part rights and responsibilities. But it's not just rushing. That's my right. You didn't give it to me. You didn't pay for this. You didn't give me my right. You didn't be with me last night at Kramak Malah. You didn't give me my right. That's the, the husband saying to the wife, because this happens a lot. Some women don't know the seriousness of it, especially newlyweds and others. And so not to rush to curse them, to divorce them, to, you know, that is a, a, a major sin. At the same time, how do you deal with that personally in your household? Are you going to rush to, you know, curse her and hope that the malaika curse her because she didn't come to bed? Or are you going to divorce her? Are you going to, we've, I've known marriages that ended after one night, literally within an hour or two. We've seen that. Wallah musta'an, because of a lack of knowledge, because of a, you know, it's a new you know, they're new to Islam, a new culture, new way of dealing with it. Those kind of things you have to realize, as our sheikh said, you know, there's compromise. That sometimes even your rights are not being fulfilled. But you are, the greater goal is keeping your marriage together on righteousness. We're not saying that it's always not fulfilled or this and that and the other. That's another problem. But sometimes we all make mistakes and we all come up short. The Prophet ﷺ said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. All the children of Adam, they make sins or mistakes. And all, and, and the best of those who make mistakes or sins are those who repent. So we have to be willing to give one another a chance. And 
everyone has a different threshold of what they can manage in their household. That's one thing we also have to realize. That some people, yes, they have sin in their household. We don't say you accept the sin. But they may have a greater threshold. I've known women that literally their husband would come home with the girlfriend. The girlfriend and the husband would be in one room watching TV and the wife, the Muslim wife, would be there because they had children and she felt powerless. And she would put up with that. That wasn't impermissible. Eventually they did divorce, but the problem, uh, what, I, what, I wanted, what I learned from that experience and seeing that firsthand was that different people have different thresholds. And it is important, you know, someone can transgress bounds are you willing to forgive them? Sometimes a household needs forgiveness for a major transgression and violation. Some people will say, no, absolutely not. You violated this major bond in, in the marriage. You cheated. You did whatever, which is a major sin and this and that and the other. Never will I forgive you. It's gone. It's finished. Some people will be like, okay, I'm hurt. We're going to work through this. You're, you seem sincere in your toba. You know, and my point is that every household is different and that issue of compromise, not compromise in the shutter, but also in how you rush to manage those, the fitna. Don't rush. Don't be mustajil. And this is what many of the scholars, and if you go to also, if you end up going to a Muslim court, you'll find that they don't rush to give the adjudication of, of divorce. They're very serious. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you go to the magistrate, you go to the Islamic court or Yemen, or wherever, you will find they don't play. It's totally different because it's an Islamic ruling and it's an Islamic hukum, rule, uh, uh, court system, and, and, uh, and, and it's very serious. So they look at these things and they look at how does talaq, uh, how does it happen, you know, and what were the circumstances? Why did you say what you did? Did you mean divorce? Unless it was a talaq sari, you know, it was a and a an, uh, very clear, unambiguous divorce, statement of divorce. But maybe you did something else and you divorced or you, you said something and you didn't mean divorce. You were just angry and you, and you did not mean divorce. The, the, the judge is going to look at that. My point is every household is different. And they, as uh, couples, they have to learn how to manage what is acceptable in their household. That's very important. The Sheikh goes on to say, he says, on the other hand, the wife also has some specific rights over her husband. These include he must <coughs> supply her with her dowry, meaning her mahar, and her maintenance. He must protect her and provide her in a way that is best for her. He must guard her from the sources of displeasure. He must treat her well and not be uh, harsh or despotic. You know, so not being oppressive and... And, uh, you know, like an oppressor over his, his household. Some people, they don't know how to talk to anyone. And they speak to their wife, cursing her. Maybe using haram language. Maybe yelling at her all the time. Some women live in fear. That they're good women, but they live in fear. Their husband over something simple as the food. There are those that divorce their wives because the food wasn't prepared. It wasn't hot enough. It wasn't like this. Because he doesn't know how to anger, he needs his anger management issues. All kind of issues arise. And there are cultural things. Some cultures are quicker to do enact violence. We're not going to mention any particular cultures. But there are some cultures that are more disposed to violence than others against their spouses. Okay? And that comes from certain traditional backgrounds and how they view women in their societies. And so forth. And the ignorance of the people. And so they might harm or divorce their wife for the simplest thing or yell and always harsh with her. You know, where's my food? What is this? What'd you do today? How come this is not done? You know, whatever. You're, you're out. You're divorced. You know, my blanket wasn't warm enough. My whatever, you know, that's being a little bit, we're blown out of proportion to a extent, but you get the point. And these are real I am trying to give you mostly real scenarios that we're aware of. So we have to be kind and gentle towards the women as men. And likewise, the women need to be kind and gentle to the men, their husbands. Indeed, he must treat her in a beautiful manner, 
with patience, softness, kindness, and forgiveness. He should overlook lapses and not pursue her mistakes. That's very important. No one wants their mistakes pursued, men nor women. But the husband cannot be a police over the wife's mistakes, like chasing her up. Yep, told you you were shot out. Oh, you did it again, even though it's been months. Yep, you're always like that. Okay, we have to be very cautious of that as men and likewise as women about chasing one another's mistakes and not overlooking the, the occasional faults that we may fall into. He should not, at the first instance of a difference of opinion or problem, let his emotional excitement allow himself to destroy the close ties of marriage. It's very important that I, I would definitely say as men in this day and age, that I believe, honestly, because of society and because of the foods we eat, as one of our uh, uh, sisters <clears throat> posted about the effects of soy and, you know, the foods that we eat that make us more effeminate, more emotional. You know, they, they uh, attack our hormones and so forth. That we can be, as men, are much less emotionally stable than probably the people in the past. I do believe this. And uh, traditional societies, especially in the past. So it has to do with our diets. It has to do with our societies. It has to do with the bombardment of, of femininity, even uh, upon men. And especially nowadays, to choose, choose your gender, this and that and the other. So what about our children? We need to be fearful of what they will be. They will be literally unisex that, no, it's not, you shouldn't act like anything. Just go and kind of like be like an animal or something and don't show that you're a man or a female, female because that's, that's too controversial and it's too, um, you're not respecting other people. You might offend someone who's in transition. Don't be a man, even though you're a man. Don't be a woman, even though you're a woman. <clears throat> so this shows us the absolute decay in society and how it has an effect upon, upon us. Now, what I was using this to mention, a habitifillah, is that as men, we tend to be more emotional. And the women need to realize that. Yeah, sometimes the man is more emotional. He may need to be corrected. He may need to be advised in a nice way, not fighting emotion with emotion. And likewise, the man, because we're being more emotional, the woman by, by her nature is more emotional. And then we emotion, emotion until you either divorce or the household that just breaks down and there's no unity, there's no harmony, there's no household. And again, later on, there's no society. All of these things, it's so imperative to strive uh, to uh, comfort one another and realize these things. So the Sheikh, he mentions, he says, Although Islam has laid the foundation, has provided the guidance that may make the family firm and protected, and what Islam has given of rights and obligations that keep the family following a straight course and will allow it to continue, even though Islam has taken all of those steps, it does not imagine... <clears throat> That every situation will be the best case and there will be no mistakes made in behavior or actions. Because Kulu ibn Adam Khatta, everyone makes mistakes. It is natural for humans to have differences of opinions and disputes when their goals or desires are different. Or when their natures are completely different. Although the family has its connection and union, it can happen that the ties become weak and change. Therefore, it is possible for disputes and division to occur within the family due to the different natures of people in different environments, backgrounds, upbringing, and so forth. This is a very important point the Sheikh is highlighting. Like I said, this book is fantastic, small in its, um, its hajim, but it's, it's, it, you know, in its size, but it's, you know, has so much import. It's so, it's really powerful. That's why I chose this to, 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 to go through this uh, text. So, the Sheikh is also acknowledging the fact, you know, people come from different cultural backgrounds. You came from the hood. This person came from a wealthy family. Your social status was like this. Yours was like this. You came from Bangladesh. He's Pakistani. You came from Bangladesh. He's African-American. You came from China. He, this, he came from Indonesia. Okay, we have different cultural, racial Traditional backgrounds, very additional, very different. And so it's very important that when that is in the mix, that can easily, the shaitan can play on that even more so. So that takes even a greater understanding, a greater, and one thing I advise, that when people marry from 
drastically different cultures. And what I mean is, for example, you're a revert and you marry uh, Somalis that came over, you know, not like Somalis now that have kind of blended in because the culture has kind of become more uniform with the people in the society. But when you, uh, you know, come from, you know, you come from a, you know, you're a revert and you marry into a traditional society or you're out of Palestinian and you marry a, an Ethiopian girl, you should have some idea, a little bit of background about their culture. It's important to be respectful, to not be uh, even, and to also realize the level of knowledge between the people. Because we've seen countless scenarios where actually people reverted to racism in their marriage. And I can think, I know specific examples of people making racist statements towards their partner when things broke down. Calling them race, racial uh, names or your people are just like this or you're like this. Why are you still like this? Sometimes not even meaning anything. And that's why I say it's good to know background about people and not be so judgmental and to empathize. Because a shaitan, when things break down, which for everyone will have struggles, not meaning a breakdown, but every marriage will have challenges that you have to be able to navigate those challenges you need something to go back to yes the book of in the sunnah but to be respectful but islam did not ignore that in fact it has provided the cure for that and has pointed to the causes it has prescribed the proper cure so the family can return to its state of happiness and pleasure such that the light of in of its son will be spread so islam has an ilaj if it does not occur that due to the resistance of one or both of the spouses that the framework of the household cannot be put back together and the spouses do not fulfill each other's proper rights and they continue in their division and enmity, then this falls under the topic in fiqh called a nashuz. Therefore, the following will define what this nashuz is, its cases, its causes, its cure, and other various rulings concerning a nashuz. So this is how the sheikh uh, ended the first section of the treaties and that's our first lesson in this treaties and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil protect us from kuli suwa makru thus ends our first lesson in the next lesson we'll talk about the actual definition of nashuz in arabic and until that assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam